Our second speaker will be presenting on Mac OS 13, what you need to know. So let's all give a warm welcome for Robert Hammond. Hello, Robert. Hello, everybody. I wait if you'd like to go ahead and share your slides, we can get started. Yep, Teams is uh, misbehaving here. Yes, we're unfortunately all aware of the uh, Teams. Slight yeah. issues with teams. <laughs> OK, so I'm going to go ahead and share this. Looks like it's cutting off just a hair, but let me see if I there can pull go. it over. There we go. And you may see me click the slides, but. Uh, this should do it, so if you'd like to go right. ahead, we'll go from there. All right, let's get started. Welcome to Mac OS 13. Uh, what you need to know. Uh, next slide. Uh, for those who don't know who I am, my name is Robert Hammond. Uh, I've been doing this supporting Max things before the days of OS 10, so it's over 20 years. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, and I've worked in a variety of industries, including you know small, medium business, education, government, and several large commercial firms. I now uh, live in the Los Angeles area and work for a large, well-known aerospace company managing several thousand Mac Apple devices. Next slide, please. So we are going to talk about uh, Mac OS 13 Ventura. Uh, this photo taken by Nate Felton. Thanks, Nate, for letting us use it from when Apple actually had an in-person event at uh, Apple Park this year uh, to, to introduce the new OS as well as the online approach. So again, it was announced at WWDC uh, last month. It already seems like more than a month and a half ago, and it will ship sometime in fall 2022. Go ahead to the next slide, please. So of course, when the name Ventura came out, people started, uh, you know, riffing memes on it. So Brad Chapman's first thought was uh, Jesse the Body Ventura, uh, followed by then Ace Ventura, Pet Detective. Places out. Remember? Let um, me go to the next slide. And then quickly it morphed into Ace Ventura. We've got Hair Force One here in both light and dark mode, uh, introducing Mac OS Ventura, complete with dog cow. So again, thanks to Brad Chapman for lending his graphic design talents and ideas. Go to the next slide. So we're going to take a look back before we get into Mac OS 13. So contrary to popular belief, Apple does have a roadmap of where they're taking things. And it's been pretty obvious for the last several Mac OS releases that Apple's been making a lot of fundamental changes to the way the OS works. Uh, generally, in person, you know, to go down the path of introducing Apple Silicon. So they needed to do a lot of groundwork, lay the groundwork for changes to the OS to be able to support that. Um, a particular point of frustration for a lot of IT organizations is that Apple does not publicly, dis you know, unlike Microsoft, Apple doesn't say, here's our roadmap, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, this will be supported for X period of time. Apple likes the flexibility and secrecy of maintaining their plans confidential, so that gives them the ability to pivot. Uh, one has to learn to read the tea leaves when dealing with Apple and where they're going. Go to the next slide, please. So in Mac OS 10.13, that was the introduction. The big part change in that was the introduction of the Apple file system. It had actually been introduced in Mac OS 10.12. However, it wasn't bootable. In order to be bootable, uh, all Macs needed firmware updates to be able to understand how to boot from an APFS formatted volume. Because Macs needed firmware updates, Apple embedded them into the OS installers. And that meant that we could no longer utilize imaging, the old process of laying down a, you know, an image on a device that had the OS and all of your applications. We moved to the automated device enrollment workflows. Um, in addition, Apple started, you know, and the, the potential for moving up uh, processor architectures, Apple said you must approve kernel extensions. You can't just have willy nilly have something be installed and have it be loaded and active. It has to be signed and it has to be proved and so on. Uh, Mac OS 10.14 introduced the concept of privacy preference policy control or PPPC which was the ability where when the system would prompt you for authorization to do something. Teams wants to use your, your camera. Teams wants to use your microphone. You know, something wants to access your desktop folder, your Donald's folder, your documents folder, etc. So, you know, we all got very good learning how to use the PPPC utility or the built in MDMs to be able to deploy profiles to allow list uh, certain processes and, and, you know, to be able to access certain resources. You can go to the next slide, please. Mac OS 1015 Catalina was another significant change. This mainly was involved changing the file system so that it would utilize two separate application and data partitions. Um, you know, the OS partition was read only. The data partition was obviously read write. Uh, 
this is kind of set in the game for going down the path of erase all content and settings, but we had a few steps to get there. Uh, Apple at that point in time officially announced the end of kernel extensions and moved to the new uh, system extensions or the endpoint security framework to replace it, which basically made every security vendor have to port their stuff to the new framework. Some were better about it than others. Next slide, please. Mac OS 11 Big Sur, again, continuing significant changes. This is the first version of Mac OS that uh, supported Apple Silicon and all the changes associated with it. Um, also was a major version change because every version of Mac OS 10 before that was 10 dot something. So now we suddenly went to 11. Uh, this made a lot of people's version detection scripts not very happy. Uh, so, you know, that, that was a pain point, but it was actually a good thing because it allowed us, I mean, if you lived through the Catalina days, how many supplemental updates did we have? Pop quiz. You know, it's like trying to keep track of versions. iOS has had the, a, a fairly sane version, you know, versioning scheme, major, minor, incremental, you know, 15.4.1, for example. So now macOS adopted it as well. Um, and again, macOS also adopted the iOS update mechanism. We lost the ability of having those combo and standalone updaters. Everything had to be pulled down from Apple software update. We got the cryptographically signed system volume and the Mac would, instead of booting from the hard drive, boots actually from one of the new APFS snapshots. You can go ahead and get to the next slide. The changes continue to Mac OS 12 Monterey, and we finally got a couple of things that the admins have been asking for for years. The number one thing, erase all content and settings. So you could rapidly return a device to, you know, a, a pretty much a, you know, a fresh state without having to like go into internet recovery and, and you know, wipe the drive and reinstall the OS or do it through some external USB drive or whatever. Uh, we also got the ability finally to add T2 and later uh, and Apple Silicon Max that were purchased outside of your normal channels where those devices were not in Apple Business Manager and were not eligible for automated device enrollment. Using iOS configurator on iOS 15, we were able to provisionally add Mac OS computers. And then another thing that was beneficial to system administrators was the managed software updates in Mac OS 12. Um, and this was the ability to send MDM update commands, update later, later and give people deferrals with an idea of enforcement. So the whole issue of trying to get people to actually update their software uh, should in theory have become less of a problem. Go to the next slide, please. Well, the reality of it is, is that Apple fundamentally broke the way software update, the software update command of the software update daemon worked in Mac OS 11. And that brokenness continued on through, I think almost every version of Mac OS 12.5. Some of you may have seen this. You will check for updates and either the check will stall or it will just report back, no update is available. So you're getting these MDM update, you know, commands issued by your administrator saying, hey, there's an update available for your Mac, please install it. And if you click on the dialogue and if you bring up system preferences and attempt to install it, it tells you there's an update available. You're like, what, what is going on? So trying to get people on Mac OS up, you know, 11 and 12 onto a newer version uh, has been problematic. In some cases, it's actually easier to just have them do download and reinstall the latest version of the OS than to try to get software update working. There is a one liner that's very prevalent that Mac had been slack using the launch CTL kickstart command to restart the uh, com.apple.softwareupdate.d daemon, which sometimes fixes the problem. Sometimes it works after a reboot, but it's really been a frustrating thing. Um, also too, the update enforcement really didn't work very well up until about 12.3. Uh, I, I have probably more Macs that are on, in my organization that are on something under 12.3 that haven't updated. Then I have devices that are on 12.3 or 12.4 that haven't updated 12.5. So, uh, you know, that's that's a problem for sure. Uh, also, something else that people have been struggling with and in my organization is no different. Uh, there have been some issues with that endpoint security framework that has caused um, basically the network connectivity to drop, you, you know, packets dropped, devices can't get addresses, things like that. And the only real solution to that is rebooting. Uh, Apple made some attempts to fix this in 12.3 and 12.4. They've made more attempts to fix it in 12.5. Not 100% certain it's really fixed yet, but it's been kind of a, a frustrating point because it's been painful for users when suddenly they're back, they wake their back from sleep and they can't get on the network without rebooting. Uh, another thing, Apple had telegraphed in the days of macOS Catalina that Python 2 would be deprecated and going away in a future macOS release. 
And yet when Mac OS 12 shipped, everyone anticipated that it would be still, you know, there and it wouldn't be until Mac OS 13, maybe that went away. And then all of a sudden Apple dropped the 12.3 betas and said Python 2 is going away in 12.3 and everybody went boom because they had Python scripts or Python embedded in their products. You know, Adobe had issues, Kanji had issues, and you know, people had to scramble to get that update. You basically to figure out their path forward with relocatable Python. So on. So go ahead to the next slide, please. So we are going to talk now about the 13 things that Mac admins will need to know about Mac OS 13. And no, I didn't plan this. It just sort of worked out. Um, go ahead to the next slide, please. One of the most impactful changes in Mac OS 13 is platform single sign on or platform SSO. Um, well, Apple's had an SSO add on to Mac OS for a while. Yes, that's the Kerberos SSO extension. Um, but that was not something that worked at the login window. That only worked after you logged into the Mac using local account credentials. Then you're, in theory, your Mac signed into the SSO, Kerberos SSO extension, which again only worked with like on premise Active Directory. Uh, it was extensible, and Apple tried to get third parties to work on it. And Microsoft did work on some beta slash prototype, uh, you know. Uh, pre-release versions of, a, of, a, of the Kerberos SSO extension, but the difference is with the platform SSO is again, that authentication at the login window. Not only that, but also at the login window, you can get a token that will authenticate you to services. And, you know, we'll talk more about that in a minute. Apple has telegraphed that this is the replacement for binding to Active Directory. If you are still binding your Macs to Active Directory in uh, 2022, you should probably try to figure out what your next approach is. Uh, while it still will work in Mac OS 13, at least as well as it has in previous versions of Mac OS, which is not really awesome. Um, you know, I think there will come a point in time when that functionality is no longer in the OS and people admin, the admin community, people in the admin community still dependent upon binding need to figure out their exit plan. And again, it does require developers to support this. So far, Microsoft is all in, so is Jump Cloud. We haven't heard anything yet from Okta or some of the other identity providers. You can go ahead to the next slide, please. So again, uh, the way this works is there's password sync between local account and the identity provider. Uh, this password sync is not every time you unlock the Mac, uh, as long as that token is generated, that token is still valid, uh, you know, it, it won't check for sync, but it does. there are circumstances where it will check for sync. Um, the one thing the platform SSO does not handle is creating that local account. So this means that products like Jamf Connect are not necessarily been, uh, you know, Sherlocked or replaced by platform SSO. Uh, also for those who have BYOD computer devices, if you tried to like say enroll a, a BYOD Mac into Intune, you had to go through several authentication prompts and they have streamlined this with enrollment SSO for user enrollment. And again, this is only user enrollment. Uh, it allows you to do things like install the company portal app, authenticate to that, and then all the authentication carries through to the, so you reduce the number of prompts that people get. Uh, again, I don't think there's a ton of people doing a lot of work with BYOD Mac devices, but be aware that Apple is making improvements in that area. You can go to the next slide, please. So Microsoft, this is a product manager for Azure AD at Microsoft, uh, and they are gung ho about this because it brings Mac OS to parity that users can sign into a Mac with their either on-prem AD or Azure AD credentials, just like Windows users, and get a token that will allow them to authenticate to Office 365 apps or Power BI or whatever, you know, so that basically you aren't, you know, we're, this is the single sign-on component of it. You're not getting constant authentication prompts. You can go to the next slide. Um, some reading material, there's some additional links with further details on this, uh, both from Jamf, Jamf, Kanji, and Microsoft. Uh, one note about all the links in this presentation, do not try, don't spend your time uh, trying to like copy these down or screenshot this or whatever. The posted in the PSU Mac channel on Mac admin Slack are all the links from my presentation uh, earlier today. So just be aware that, that exists. So no need to, to rush and hurry. So you can advance to the next slide. So another significant change uh, in Mac OS 13 revolves around automated device enrollment. And there was always a gotcha. There was a method that people had when they would go, you would ship a Mac to a new user, let's say, and that, it's not like we've shipped a bunch of Macs to people over the last two and a half years with a pandemic and a lot of remote work. Um, could ship a Mac to that user and the Mac could actually bypass enrollment into your MDM 
by if they knew how to do this by in the setup screen where you know they would say other network options and say my mac doesn't connect to the internet well apple is closing that loophole in mac os 13 but sort of there's a catch so if you take a new out of the box mac that's never been provisioned or enrolled and ship it to someone they can still uh they can still bypass it once however that mac has been enrolled or and, and considered by apple to be accepted by your organization then that that information is recorded in apple's activation servers so subsequent uh, attempts to activate and enroll that device the option is no longer present that people can no longer bypass uh, automated device enrollment so how do you get devices this way well probably one way this would work would be simply to take a new mac out of the box and use configure to restore this is the fastest way to get a mac a to the current os or b you know, return to service without using a, a wipe or erase all content and settings. Um, if you've already got the IPSW for Mac OS 13 pulled on your machine, a, a configure to restore is anywhere from six, seven minutes or so from start to finish. So again, your organization, if you have workflows where you have either you or your uh, the, the vendor you are purchasing your Mac from direct ship to employees, you may reconsider that if you want to if you want to ensure that these devices are, you know, enrolled in automated device number one and can't bypass it, and then bring them in house and do a configure and restore. Uh, that's been our standard operating procedure at my place of work for uh, for a while. Uh, we like to make sure that we put the latest version of Mac OS or iOS or iPad OS on a device, so we leverage configurator uh, quite extensively. So you can proceed to the next slide. All right, a really big change uh, in Mac OS 13 that affects not only admins, but other users is the deprecation of system preferences. The old system preferences from Mac OS 10 to Mac OS 12 is now gone. It's been replaced by an app called System Settings, which looks uh, very similar to and functionally identical to the Settings app on iOS and iPad OS. So on iOS, you know, on Mac OS, you used to going to System Preferences Software Update. On iOS, you go to system, you know, to settings, general software update. So where do you think you go on Mac OS 13? System settings, general software update. So if you have documentation that explains to people how to access resources like software update, that's going to have to be updated. If you have scripts that do things like nudge people to, uh, you know, to update their software by opening the software update preference pane, you're gonna wanna make sure those scripts accurately open the software update settings on Mac OS 13. There also are, are some concerns over um, the ability to suppress or hide certain preference panes. For example, some orgs may block the profiles pane so people can't see what MDM config profiles are on a device or unmanaged device. Some orgs may block the certif disk because they don't want people booting from external media or exfiltrating data when the device isn't booted, bypassing their DLP software. So uh, this is a changing situation in Mac OS 13 because when the first betas came out, a lot of these things that we were used to having didn't work. Uh, Apple got a lot of feedback on it. Some of these things I think were planned to not work. Some of those things were not there. Uh, so some things have changed. Another point, uh, particularly around networking, there's a lot of different things that we're used to being able to do in the network preference pane, or you know, on, in system preferences on Mac OS 12 and earlier that simply were not there in the betas. So it's critical that you evaluate this and file uh, feedback with Apple, which we'll talk more about in a bit. Uh, we can go ahead and proceed to the next slide. OK, this is probably the most controversial, at least as far as Mac admins uh, go, uh, change in Mac OS Ventura, and that is this concept of login items. And this is what Apple is calling login items. Now, it's not the same thing as the login items associated with your user account where you could say that you know when my computer when i log into my mac i wanted to boot up you know apple music so i can play my tunes it's not that what apple's referring to login items here these are things like launch demons and launch agents which typically are associated with you know in an enterprise environment are associated with your security tools your antivirus tool your mdm management tool if it has an agent you know any other particular software that you may install in the system so it's also a tool, launch agents and launch demons, that are used by malware authors. So Apple's trying to tighten the noose on this, at least for, you know, at least for uh, 
home users and corporate use and some corporate users by a giving people controls to be able to disable these things. Number one, number two, giving them notifications when things are installed. Um, so many admins were alarmed over the fact that there was no way to prevent the users from being able to turn off some of these launch agents and launch demons and effectively disabling their security tools. Now, again, to be fair, people who are advanced users who understand the terminal and know about the commands like launch CTL could still, you know, if they're admins, they could still do this. But there's a big difference between, you know, having that knowledge and just being able to go into system settings and toggle a slider. So this has probably been this. I, I would. It's unquestioned that Apple has received a ton of feedback on this issue. Um, it's something that is not yet addressed, not even in the beta that just dropped yesterday. So this is still one of those moving target things uh, that you'll have to keep an eye on. And in general, Ventura has been one of those releases where there are a lot of moving targets. Uh, you know, reference this, reference the, all the other changes around system settings. So this is something that you will need to keep an eye on and you'll want to test in your environment. If you have any specific workflows that require certain things like being able to reorient network service order or, you know, you know, some custom DHCP settings or DNS server settings for Wi-Fi and that you'll want to make sure that stuff is present in the system settings in the uh, Ventura betas and file feedback if there are workflows that you have that will not work without these items present. So you can go ahead and proceed. Okay, this is a nice security feature in macOS. So one of the pain points with managing devices, Apple devices, is, I mean, well, you know, one of the good things, of course, is that Apple do, is very responsive to security incidents and will drop security updates to patch things. Uh, one of the bad things is this generally requires people to reboot their devices, which people are tend to be reticent to do because people are busy and they're just used to sleeping their laptop and not waking it up for a, you know, or not put not restarting it for a month or two, you know, unless the user starts getting machine starts acting weird or they get tired of all the nags to update their stuff. So what Apple has done is they've made some architectural changes to Mac OS 13 that allows them, as well as iOS uh, 16 and iPad OS 16, that allows them to release updates to certain OS components that do not require a restart. Uh, if you've ever checked system preferences on your Mac uh, and there's, you know, there's setting under software update, one of the options for install uh, system files and security updates or something like that, it's basically Apple's leveraging that checkbox to be able to install these things. So, okay, so if Apple is pushing updates, if I enable this on my fleet, which you should, uh, and Apple is pushing updates to components of my fleet, how do I know this Mac is patched? So the best answer that I saw, and I hope this is still the case, is that your Mac OS version will not change through one of these rapid security response changes, but the build number to the OS will change. Um, if you're not familiar with build numbers, this is how we used to keep track of what build of Mac, what version of Mac OS, uh, you know, 10, 15 would run on this particular Mac. Uh, besides the version number, there was also a build number associated. And every, every new version of the OS has a new build number. Uh, and they're not necessarily, you know, incremental. I mean, they, they might, some might jump 10 numbers, some might jump 20. It just depends on how many iterations of development Apple under, underwent when they were uh, developing that version of Mac OS. So, um, you know, th that's something that admins are gonna have to keep an eye on, uh, looking at build number. And uh, also, you know, just in general, Apple will roll those change components into the next minor OS update. So 13.0 comes out and there's a big security issue. Apple can release this patch that'll increment the build number. And of course, when, you know, 13.01 or 13.1 drops, that patch should be rolled in or included. So you can advance to the next slide, please. Um, this is a, another change that I think is pretty significant and it's also nice. Um, if you are using these, you know, system preferences app to update to Mac OS 13, but, but before Mac OS 13, when you would do this, it would pull down the whole install Mac OS. Let's say you were on Mac OS Big Sur. You wanted to upgrade to Monterey through system preferences. It would actually download the entire 11 plus gigabyte install Mac OS Monterey dot app in your applications folder and then execute it. And then of course it deleted itself after it was done. But every Mac got that full download. Uh, and it was downloaded as a, basically as an app. With Mac OS 13, uh, this will come down as a, just another software update package to be installed. And the size will vary upon what version of the OS you're running. Now, if you have workflows that are dependent upon getting a copy of install macOS Ventura.app, 
Uh, you can still do that. You may have to go to the app store to do it. Uh, certainly the software update fetch full installer command. Uh, there's some more additional options you'll need for it. Uh, can pull those updates down and there are third party tools and what I've highlighted here is a neat, pretty neat tool called mist. Uh, that you can use to pull down the actual installers if you need the full installation. For some reason, again, most people would shouldn't. You can advance to the next slide. And again, credit to uh, our good buddy Ryan, aka Mr. Mac. Uh, if you don't check out his Mr. Macintosh website, uh, it can be a very good resource for you people who manage uh, Mac OS at scale. So this is his tweet uh, talking about this change. So you can skip the next slide. Okay, a new feature introduced in Mac OS 13, iOS 16 and iPad OS 16 is lockdown mode. So this is kind of a response to some of the very well known and publicized things like the NSO uh, spyware and so on. Typically these, these uh, sorts of things are targeted attacks by intelligence operations. Uh, against very high profile individuals. And usually what happens is they leverage some kind of image or you know, attachment vulnerability that overflows a buffer and allows them to get control of a device and so on. So Apple has this idea of lockdown mode that you can enable in these devices. When a device, when lockdown mode is enabled, this device cannot be enrolled in an MDM or install profiles. Now, if the device is already installed and enrolled in an MDM, it will, it will be, it will stay enrolled but it just can't get a new enrollment. Um, a lot of changes around messages. Basically the little previews you get when somebody sends you like a Twitter link or a website link, those are shut off because we are trying to avoid that possibility of leveraging some kind of buffer overflow with an Im image or attachment uh, to compromise the machine. You know, some vulnerability that Apple may not be aware of. So it locks messages down to, to not display the previews, you know, so you can't be compromised simply by somebody sending you a text message or an iMessage. You can't receive FaceTime calls or other Apple service solicitations from users that you have not interacted with previously. That's another feature of lockdown mode. As well as uh, Safari on Mac OS, iOS, and iPad OS will disable some features like JavaScript just-in-time compilation uh, on most sites, which will reduce performance unless you whitelist them. Like, hey, this is my company site. I know this is safe. Let's go ahead and enable it. Or I really got to log into this payroll site or whatever. But just in general, this is another way to reduce the, the possible attack surface uh, on a system. And again, the number of people that actually need this is probably fairly small, but it's a very nice feature to actually have. So you can advance to the next slide, please. Okay, a big change uh, in Mac OS 13. I could spend the whole hour talking about declarative MDM. Uh, this is something that Apple actually announced last year in iOS 15, but it was something that was only available for user enrollment devices. So it was Apple's kind of like training wheels, try this out sort of thing. Uh, it is now fully supported in iOS and iPad OS 16, as well as Mac OS 13, but your MDM vendor uh, of choice must support the declarative MDM features, which I'm pretty sure most of the major MDM vendors are. What their timeframes are, that's to be determined. So I'll go ahead and advance the slide. So MDM, when you think about it, for those of us who've been managing iOS devices since the iPhone first came out, remember the iPhone configuration utility and being able to build profiles that you could then be a tethering install a device. And then Apple, of course, invented the whole concept of Apple push notifications, as well as inventing the MDM protocol. So this is designed in the 2008-2010 I timeframe. You know, it was delivered with iOS 4 and ported to Mac OS as of OS 10.7 Lion. So the MDM protocol, when it was designed, was designed the server was the all-knowing, all-powerful, and the clients were dumb. Because again, servers were powerful and the clients were much less so than they are today. So the server would query the device for status and the device would report its status back and the server would say, okay, you're missing this, you need this profile, you need this, this is in scope, and it would then push those profiles or apps or what have you to the, or to the device to put it into the desired state. So again, the server is doing all the work. What happens is you're, the number of devices you're managing with MDM increases significantly. You're putting more and more load in that server. So now you run into scaling issues with that server and you have to you know, be careful about how many devices you have and whether you you know build a cluster and you know when you have agents like 
the jam agent or whatever, how often do they check in? You have to adjust those things when you start getting 10,000, 20,000, 100,000 systems talking to an MDM. So it was, an MDM in general has needed to be refactored uh, for a long period of time. So the Apple's, the, the declarative stuff is Apple's first go at doing this. Uh, you can advance to the next slide. So we are shifting the paradigm from the server being all powerful and the device being dumb you know, the device is basically a reactive approach to where it's more of a, the device is more proactive and the device has the power to do things that it's in scope for. The device can evaluate its own state and then can take actions. Oh, I'm supposed to have the firewall on, it's not, I'm gonna enable it. I'm, I'm, I've got a password, passcode profile in scope and there's no passcode set, I'm gonna nag the user to do it. Doesn't need the MDM server to do that. And the device can also detect changes on the device and report that status back to the MDM server. So it's no longer the server pulling the information from the device. The device is pushing changes data back up to the MDM server. And again, enforcement and changes can be done on the device without the server knowing or issuing those commands to, to remediate it. So we can skip to the next slide. Uh, you can preload things like configurations on a device that are activated when certain conditions are met. So one of the challenges with MDM has been, you know, as Apple releases new OS versions, uh, we was not, you know, it was not possible to pre-stage settings for iOS 16 onto a device running iOS 15. So the only time that those things would actually get pushed is when that iOS 16 device would update. The device would update to 16 and would check back into the MDM, at which point it's like, oh, well, you're on this now. Here, get this new profile that has new settings. So this is an attempt to be able to pre-stage those settings before an OS update. So they take effect afterwards without waiting for that MDM communication. You can advance to the next slide. So declarations convey policies, like again, accounts, settings, restrictions. They can be across the board of all devices or they can be scoped to specific devices or users, smart groups, static groups, that sort of thing. You can advance to the next slide. There are four types of declarations. There's configurations, which are very similar to the profiles we worked with before, except we're not doing XMLP lists anymore. We're doing JSON. Uh, then there's assets, which can be things like user accounts, email addresses, and so on. Uh, groups of configurations are called activations. And then there's the management channel, which is organizational information on the overall state of the device. Slide to the next. Uh, the status channel. The MDM server, again, can subscribe to changes in the device state, like I updated the device, or I set a passcode, or I downloaded an app, or, or. Um, and like, in, it's, there are some additional changes, uh, like the presence of compliance of passcodes, accounts, and information on the state of MDM app installations, but that's for I, iOS and iPadOS only, which is a shame, because if there's anything that needs some attention from Apple, some love, it's MDM deployment of applications on macOS. They don't work very well. Anybody who's tried to deploy Xcode uh, will tell you that. Uh, advance to the next slide, please. So again, this protocol is extensible. The MDM and device can communicate about new functionality. And again, we can push new settings down depending on what's going on. Again, we're getting more if people have worked with like stateful configuration management tools like Puppet or, you know, or Chef or, or, or so on, uh, getting a little bit more of that functionality uh, in that, that kind of ability with MDM. Go ahead to the next slide, please. So this is still very much a 1.0 uh, product, even if it's actually the second, you know, in the, it's in the second iOS version, the first macOS and iPadOS version. Um, there's been a lot of things with, with declarative MDM where I said, hey, with declarative MDM, could I do X? And they're like, no, it's not designed to do that yet, but we've got that asked from somebody else. Or could I do Y? No, it doesn't do that yet, but why don't you put a feedback request in? So, you know, I think it's something that I know personally, I'm still trying to wrap my head about what's what's possible today and what might be possible in the future. And I have a feeling there's going to be a lot of asks and it's something that's going to grow over time. Um, a couple of blog posts uh, from a couple of the major MDM vendors, Jamp and Kanji, on uh, getting to know declarative management and what it is, if you want to learn further. Uh, again, it's something that we're going to have to keep an eye on. You're going to want to talk to your MDM vendor and figure out what their... Uh, you know, time frame is for implementation. And just because they implement, they say they implement declarative MDM, are they, are they implementing all the features of it? Uh, probably not right away. Uh, a new feature in Mac OS 13 for Apple Silicon based uh, Macs only and laptops only 
is what's called accessory security. We've had this sort of thing on iOS uh, already. If you've ever done this, I know I do this. I've got a bunch of uh, Macs on my desk at work, and sometimes I will uh, plug my personal iPhone into one of the Macs to charge it. Except my phone will say, please unlock this phone to, you know, and do I want to trust this computer to, you know, in order to, to able to charge. So Apple has added this accessory security functionality to Mac OS 13, again, for Apple Silicon laptops. So anything that's USB or Thunderbolt, not anything, but USB and Thunderbolt devices will require user approval with the exception of some display types and also charging. That'll happen without it. Um, this is something you'll definitely want to test in your environment because people have had different experiences with docs. Seems like most of the USB-C Ethernet adapters work fine. If you're dependent upon Ethernet for provisioning, it would be a real problem if you can't even get to approve it and it didn't work. So, um, and there are uh, some options in system settings. You can turn it off. You can have it where it, you know, always, always ask, you know, uh, I think if you approve it, it lasts for three days. You can, or you can say never ask, just allow everything. So again, it tightens up the security uh, with physical access. So if anybody remembers the old Thunder Strike from Thunderbolt, uh, days when the people were breaking modified Ethernet adapters that could pwn a Mac. Uh, this is sort of another way to minimize the chance of that sort of thing happening. So we can advance to the next slide. Okay, a really nice feature uh, that leverages the secure enclave and the T2 and up Macs and also the Apple Silicon Macs. So uh, it's called managed device attestation. So how many people have worked with uh, SCEP? which uh, is a way of getting certificates. Oh, I'm sorry, if you're Microsoft, you use SCEP as a term to describe an uh, AV product, so you called it NDES. But this is an old technology uh, that you know predates TLS that pulls allows you to pull a certificate for a device. Um, and what Apple's doing with managed at device attestation is they're leveraging the ACME uh, approach that Let's Encrypt invented to allow devices, to, to allow, you know, certificates can be created in a secure enclave using public private key pairs. Uh, the advantage of being in a secure enclave is that you can prevent them from being exported. So I can't take the cert off of Mac A and install it on Mac B and make it appear or present itself that it is Mac A. You know, so you so a device from your organization gets stolen, there's not a concern that somebody could exfiltrate that user cert or device cert off the device and then use that to authenticate to services like VPN, you know, zero trust websites, mail servers, what have you. So this is a very, very welcome change and definitely improves the security posture, uh, you know, of macOS. So I'm very much looking forward to this managed device attestation. Now, one caveat with this is if you know, and we'll talk more about this when we talk about the uh, devices that support macOS 13. Not all devices that support macOS 13 have a secure enclave. There are still some devices that don't have a T2 chip. They will not be able to leverage this feature. So I know in my own organization, I, we have a few of those type devices like 2017 MacBook Pros and 2018 Mac Minis. Uh, you know, pretty likely that we will cut, we will get rid of those so we can move to a fully supported, uh, you know, secure enclave workflow because we've got a lot of plans around this feature. So go ahead to the next slide. Okay, here's another feature uh, that Apple has introduced. So a big buzz in the security industry is what's called passwordless. Passwords are definitely a weak point. People forget them, people reuse them. It's very easy to fish them. You know, send you a link that says it's from PayPal and you click it and you enter your credentials and guess what? You've just given your PayPal password to someone else. So passwords alone as an authentication method aren't awesome. So we have MFA, but it's possible to clone phones or intercept those MFA uh, requests. So what Apple has been done and worked with on many of the other uh, industry vendors to make this more of a, a cross-platform standard is the concept of passkey. This is a cert-based alternative password that is end-to-end -end encrypted. Uh, unlike passwords, I, this can't be phished. And it's designed again to be cross-platform. I mean, it's not something that just supports on Mac and iOS and Safari. It's designed to work on Chrome and Windows and so on. Um, now, because there may be situations like, say, I may need, may need to give my wife access to the password to log in to pay the bill uh, for the electric company, um, the, the idea behind passkeys, the implementation today, is that passcodes can be shared and there's no way to mark them as being not shareable. 
Um, also, passwords today are contingent upon iCloud Keychain. This presents a problem for a lot of organizations for a couple of reasons. Number one, people in highly regulated industries tend to avoid cloud-based services because it's uh, pretty much a vector for data exfiltration, whatnot. And the fact that these things can be shared also makes it a very, uh, you know, without any controls, makes it very unlikely that organizations will want to adopt passkeys today. Uh, the other thing is that organizations that are using managed Apple IDs, uh, which is where you can federate uh, your uh, Mac to, uh, you know, Azure AD or recently Google. Uh, so you have these, you know, so, so everybody who has an account with your organization has, a, has an Apple ID. Those managed Apple IDs were originally designed for education and they're severely restricted. They, there's not a lot you can do with them. You can't buy apps. Uh, you can't do things like uh, continuity camera or, you know, or so on. And, you, you know, iCloud is not a thing with, with uh, iCloud Keychain is not a thing with managed Apple IDs. So passkeys is more of a consumer feature. The enterprise aspects of it are still to be determined. This is yet another one of those variable things. And this may not get better until Mac OS 14, or maybe even later than that. So we can advance to the next slide. OK, this is a small change, but it's a welcome one. Uh, has anybody tried to use Migration Assistant to migrate user data from one Mac to another? User gets a new 2021 14-inch MacBook Pro coming from a 2017 13-inch MacBook Pro. Let's use Migration Assistant to migrate their data. Let's check all the boxes. and. It may or may not work, but you suddenly notice that new Mac is not getting MDM profiles associated with it. And it turns out if you have the option for system and network settings checked when you use Migration Assistant, what actually happens is that MDM profile from the old Mac gets migrated to the new one, but it's not, not in a functional way. So basically the machine becomes MDM deaf and you may have to you know, mess around to try to get it re-enrolled or erase it and reset it up, which kind of gets around the point of why you set the person up with a new Mac in the first place. So if you knew better, you could uncheck that option, but there was no way in MDM to prevent people from checking that. So a lot of organizations uh, went around actually blocking or restricting the migration assistant app from being used and used other alternative methods, whether it was just copying files to a file server share or using rsync or whatever to get data transferred. So Apple is now in Mac OS 13. If your Mac is enrolled in an MDM, that option to check system and network settings will no longer be selectable. So you cannot accidentally uh, screw up your new Mac. So you can advance to the next setting. OK, uh, so the managed updates, we talked about them and how they worked. Didn't work up until 12.3, work as well as software update works. Uh, but there's still situations. A lot of users will just simply take their Mac home and close the lid and not plug it into power so the Mac's asleep. So you could enforce the update with deferrals, but if that Mac was asleep, it would not actually attempt to update. Similarly, if the user had power nap, maybe it was plugged in, but it had a power nap enabled, it may not update. The Mac wasn't on. So they've added this change in Mac OS 13 to now be able to do updates, again, either with power nap slash dark wake or if the Mac is asleep. Although again, if you do have documents open or maybe like terminal open, uh, that are not saved, that'll still prevent the updates from running. You can also set a priority key on a minor update, high or low. You know, so like there's a really important update for, you know, let's say there's a really important update, Mac OS 12.13.1, I want everybody to get it. I can designate it as high priority update. I can't do this to get people to Mac OS 14. It's only for minor version updates. So advance to the next slide. Um, so again, with Mac OS 12, we got the ability to use Configurator on iOS 15 to provisionally add a Mac to your Apple Business Manager or Apple School Manager instance. If that Mac was purchased, like somebody went to the retail, retail store with a P card and bought a Mac. So it wasn't associated you know, with your Apple Business Manager or Apple School Manager account, yet you wanted the benefits of automated enrollment. You could use Configurator to do this. But if you had iOS devices or iPad OS devices, you still had to use Configurator on Mac to do this. Well, now uh, with iOS 16, you can add iOS and iPad OS 16 devices with the latest version of Configurator for iOS 16. Uh, the slight difference is that what you have to do with a Mac is when you boot that Mac up and you get to the language selection window, then you bring your, your iPhone 
with the computer app open in close proximity, i.e. Bluetooth, uh, to the Mac, and it'll pop up that window with one of those rotating three-dimensional images that you then use the camera on the phone to you know, take a picture of, and that will actually, again, add that device. So now in iOS 16, we can do the same thing with iPad OS 16 and iOS 16 devices. The only difference is you do this at the network selection, the Wi-Fi network selection window, not the language chooser. So go ahead to the next slide. Um, there are a number, handful of miscellaneous changes. So um, one change that Apple hasn't done a super awesome job of communicating about is there are some changes relating to applications like Monkey or scripts that you might have that allow that are allowed to update other apps. And some of the earlier betas of macOS Venture at least didn't work. Then somebody said, hey, there's a new MDM key to do this. And then the reality is what it seems we've figured out, according to some of our former admin buddies now working for Apple, is that uh, you know full disk access for the most part should allow those things to work. But if you don't want to give those apps uh, full disk access, you can use this new MDM key as long as you're, you know, as long as you can create a custom profile or your MDM supports it. So you're going to want to test things like Monkey. Do you need to sign your Monkey app? Things like that. There's again, this is one of those things where Ventura is still a moving target. Um, there have been some additions to the endpoint security framework where it will record things like authentications, extra protect detections, malware removal tool removal of things, SSH sessions into that Mac, screen sharing sessions in that Mac. Uh, Apple's basically has left, you know, since very early in Mac OS, uh, Apple has leveraged the open BSM audit framework, which some commercial tools like uh, Jamf's compliance reporter are dependent upon for logging these sorts of things. But Apple has deprecated that framework and would like to replace it and rip it out of Mac OS. Uh, so they've been adding some of the functionality that people use open BSM auditing for uh, into the endpoint security framework. So now it will be, be upon those vendors like Jamf to modify their software to fully support it. Uh, something that has been uh, considered deprecated and may go away in a future release since Mac OS 10.15 were CUPS and the PPDs and printer drivers. Uh, everything's moving to IPP, but as far as I know, everything is still working in Mac OS 13 yet. It is not gone yet. Uh, for anyone who ever used classic Mac OS, and you remember the print, the page setup dialog in classic Mac OS, we had this lovely icon you see in the uh, upper left-hand corner of the screen uh, called, and that was Clarus the dog cow, because nobody knew if that was really supposed to be a dog or a cow. It's spotted, and it's got a tail and four legs, but not really show. Uh, for bonus points, if you can mimic the sound the dog cow makes, it's oof. Well, Clarus the dog cow, has returned from a many year exodus from classic Mac OS to the page setup dialog in Mac OS 13. So there's your longtime Mac admin uh, Easter egg for everyone. Go ahead to the next slide. One more change that may affect some people. Um, if you deploy certificate payloads to end, you know, that's the best way to get a device to trust, you know, an internal certificate authority or something like that. So you can use a, a configuration profile to deploy this via MDM, and those things are automatically trusted. But if you have an alternative workflow where say that you deploy that profile manually to devices, like I make, I email this profile to someone and so on, a cert trust profile installed manually doesn't actually trust the certs. You very likely have to go into keychain access and adjust the trust settings there. And again, this is to get around some of these edge cases that some of these malware uh, authors have, have developed to compromise devices, be able to intercept traffic and things like that. So making it less of an automatic process is actually a good thing. Again, this is not something that should affect most people, but some people may have very esoteric workflows about putting profiles on devices to trust, you know, manually to trust uh, certificate authorities. You're gonna have some issues with Mac OS 13. So uh, go ahead to the next slide. Um, and again, a lot of these resources are all links are posted in Slack. We have the official Apple pages. There's a ton of consumer features in Mac OS. You can look at Apple's website and tell you that. I'm here mainly to talk to you about all the features as somebody who administers and manages and deploys devices, the things that you need to worry about. So you can go ahead to the next slide. So 
it goes without saying you should be you should already have been testing Mac OS Ventura. If you're not, you need to start now. Uh, you should start, you know, when it's released on the Monday of WWDC. On Mac Admin Slack, there's the Apple Dev RSS channel. And every time Apple releases a beta version of some OS, a new OS, a current OS, uh, it, you know, Mac OS, iOS, iPad OS, TV OS, watch OS, it's posted there. So that's kind of your, I don't need an email from Apple, I can just look at this channel. Uh, it's a read-only channel for the most part, so definitely want to keep that on your subscribe list in Slack. And getting back to that point when Python was removed in Mac OS 12.3, it's really important that you at least work with the beta, you read the release notes and test the beta versions of Mac OS of the year because there can sometimes be fundamental changes that affect will affect your systems and workflows in the middle of the year. Don't assume the major changes happen every fall with the release of a new Mac OS. And when I say fall, I mean fall in North America. Or at least the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, we can advance to the next slide. So because Ventura is still in flux, so dynamic, it's a really good idea to test Ventura now. Why? Because you have the ability to provide feedback to Apple and say, hey guys, I love this feature, but this feature is a big problem for us. It's a deployment blocker. You need to be able to do that. Uh, if people, if Apple does not get feedback about these things, the OS will ship, not in a desired state, and you will have issues. And some people may not be able to deploy Mac OS Ventura. Uh, you may also find bugs or issues, both for Apple or things that are specific or unique to your environment. Uh, it's a good idea to be ready to support the new OS when, uh, you know, by the time that it releases. Uh, I recognize that can be challenging for people, especially in the education, you know, when you're in the middle of a school year typically. But a lot of times Apple will have new hardware lined up that is dependent. We've seen this in iOS all the time. Every fall, there's a new iOS release, and there's also a new iPhone release that's tied to that new iOS release. And Apple does the same things with macOS and macOS devices. So if we advance to the next slide. A lot of it has to do with the changing security models. You know, we're in an ever-connected world. Uh, every day there are new discoveries about security vulnerabilities, new things that need to be patched. Uh, anybody who manages things like Chrome, how many up to Chrome updates or Firefox updates do you get in a month? How many iOS updates and so on? And so we are in this cycle where information about these vulnerabilities is out there. You know, something is disclosed and usually within hours, if not minutes, people are probing systems, trying to see, find unpatched systems on the internet to see if they can be compromised. So the slow methodical approach of being able to like, okay, here's an update to Mac OS, let's release it to a test group and we'll let them run on it for a week and see how it works and we'll roll it up. Those days are gone. For your, unless your organization is one where they don't have any online presence, people are literally air gapped and not using the internet. You need to be having your stuff patched ASAP. Uh, advance to the next slide. And, you know, again, developers have their cadences. Uh, Office for Mac gets a new release in the middle of every month. Adobe has their patch Tuesdays every month. Not, a, not all apps are updated every month. Sometimes they're out of band update releases. Apple, of course, has the new uh, major Mac OS and iOS releases in the fall. Usually there's a dot one release within the first 30 days, then the updates spread out over to 45 or 60 days or so, depending upon changes and holidays and things like that. And again, that Apple spring release like 12.3 can have big surprises in it. So if you're not paying attention, you can have all sorts of problems. I'm gonna go to the next slide. So you will never ever find this document anywhere that Apple will provide patches for, this is Apple's unofficial policy. It's called the N-2 approach. Apple will provide patches for the current OS release and the previous two. So we're on Mac OS 12 right now, so that means we're getting updates for Mac OS 11 and Mac OS 10, 15. So what happens when Mac OS 13 drops? We'll be getting updates for 12 and 11, and 10, 15 will fall out of support. Well, just because Apple is releasing patches for these OS doesn't mean they're patching every vulnerability. Uh, they will make judgment calls about, you know, how involved a patch is and how difficult it may be to pack, to backport those patches to old OSs, and they may decide not to update them. Uh, advance to the next slide. The net result is if you want to have the most secure Mac, you have to be on the latest OS as soon as possible. And this is yet another reason why you want to be running Ventura, you know, 
that you want to you want your users to be able to upgrade to Ventura the day that it ships. Next slide. So system requirements for Mac OS 13. So Apple has pretty much deprecated the 2015 uh, and for the most part 2016 um, Macs. We are 2017 and later. Uh, and again, the first uh, Macs that had the T2 processor chip was the late 2017, I think it was iMac Pro. And then like the mid 2018 MacBook Pros. Anything prior to that doesn't have a T2 processor. So it's not able to be provisionally added to device enrollment. You're not able to use managed device attestation and so on. And particularly if those machines are, are Mac laptops that they haven't had the keyboard in place, they probably don't work so good because of the butterfly keyboard issues. So organizationally, you may want to make some you know, tough calls about how far back devices you want to support. Um, you know, also in here too, the 2013 Mac Pro is gone as is the 2014 Mac Mini. The 2018 Mini is still around, as well as the Apple Silicon one. But we're pretty much looking at 2017 in that. And if you recall, you know, some of the last Intel Macs Apple introduced were in 2019, early 2020. We're, you know, in a, in a couple of years, we'll be two or three years, we'll be at that point in time where Apple will probably end up dropping support for Intel. Uh, we're not there yet, but you know, we're the the wheel of progress is turning. So we can advance to the next slide. So some basics on how do you get Ventura? You know, the developer program for $99 a year, you can get, uh, you can join the developer program as an individual. This is, this might be beneficial to your org uh, if you want to be able to, you know, you get installer certs or application certs, you know, sign your apps, sign your installers, notarize your apps or packages. Uh, you may want to do the company, which I think is $300 for that. If you have multiple individuals, you don't want it to just show up as under you. Uh, that's one way, but it's not a requirement to get Ventura. Uh, there's also the public beta. Uh, now it usually doesn't come out until a month or so after, you know, WWDC. So, you know, sometime in July for the last two OS releases. Can flip to the next slide. Uh, you know, you can use that missed utility to pull the beta down. It's on Apple software update catalogs. There's nothing preventing you from that. You can also use the seed util command. Uh, to set your Mac to the developer seed. It's another way to get access to the betas. Not recommended way, but it is possible. Advance to the next slide. So assuming you're using Apple Business Manager or Apple School Manager, which pretty much everybody should be for automated device enrollment, you actually have access to Apple Seed for IT simply by logging into appleseed.apple.com slash IT with a managed Apple ID. What is a managed Apple ID? It's one of the accounts you use to sign into Apple Business Manager or School Manager. And as an aside, you definitely want to make sure that you do not use developer IDs to submit feedback. You want to submit them using Apple Seed or you know Apple Business Manager, Apple School Manager associated Apple IDs, because that feedback will go to the wrong channel. Feedback going to about enterprise issues going to developer channels will probably be ignored. Feedback going to the you know the Apple Seed for IT channel is going to be get attention paid to it by people on the enterprise team at Apple. So you can advance to the next slide. Um, the three things that are available for, that are super helpful uh, on Apple Seed are the what's new for enterprise and education PDF. This usually drops right around the same time the WWDC keynote drops. And it's a fairly long PDF that you, you know, you'll want to read through. Everybody should read this. Who has to admin Max. Sign into you know Apple Seed for IT and download if you haven't already. Uh, also available on here is called the Mac Evaluation Utility. We're going to talk about that more in the next slide. And then there are test plans for various use cases that they want you to follow. To test, you know, features of Mac OS 13 year environment. So let's advance to the next slide. So Mac Eval Utility is an application that you can and should run on your corporate network to determine whether or not any of Apple's required services are blocked. Like some organizations will arbitrarily decide they want to block iCloud, but that might cause other problems. Or they may do SSL inspection of traffic, which will definitely break uh, things like uh, Apple updates. So Mac Eval Utility, this is the result screenshot of running Mac Eval Utility. And you'll see that there are some things where there are caution or some things with error icons in there. So uh, a lot of times it's, it's important to do this and run this, not only just on like your main corporate network, but on, you know, like on your Ethernet network, on your wired network, if you have multiple locations, try it on different networks at different locations, get the results. Um, 
The knowledge base article below is one called Using Apple Products and Enterprise Networks. If I had a dollar for every time I sent this link to somebody on a network team telling them that they needed to fix their firewall, well, I'd be retired by now. Uh, that's that is very critical. One of the crappy things is that Apple periodically updates this page and does not publish a change log. So you may want to use the Internet Archive machine and to potentially diff the files. Really wish Apple would fix that. Next slide, please. So testing, this has been a, something that's varied over the years. How do you test this? Um, yeah, and whatever you do, do not install beta one on your daily driver. When it comes out, you are just asking for trouble. So you have the conundrum of VMs versus physical hardware. So prior to Catalina, we had it pretty good. We could do testing using like VMware or Parallels, and we could actually like steal a serial number of the Mac and edit a configuration file in the, you know, in the, in the VM and have that actually test automated device enrollment on a VM. And that kind of broke in the Catalina days. And, you know, it may have been some workarounds to get it working and stuff like that, but it was really fragile. And in general, a lot of the virtualization tools, uh, particularly on Apple Silicon, you know, a lot of the third party ones, the VMware's and such, haven't worked so good. So um, one of the things that Apple did introduce starting in Catalina and has had seen some revisions is their virtualization framework to allow you to run a VM. Uh, and I've actually done this on Apple Silicon on an M1 uh, Mac, and it works amazingly well, uh, except it does not allow you to test automated device enrollment because I can't associate a serial number with the device. And in general, the automated device enrollment is moving beyond uh, the ability to do things with a VM. You're probably going to need physical hardware because there are things in automated device enrollment that may affect like on an Intel Mac with a T2 processor that may affect bridge OS, or there may be things that may affect, you know, stuff on a Apple Silicon machine that you really cannot emulate. So the days of really being able to test uh, enrollment, automated device enrollment on a virtual machine are probably over. But that doesn't mean that virtualization isn't useless. You can go to the next slide. Um, I very, very definitely recommend the first beta or two that you do this on a virtualized uh, environment. Uh, rather than a physical hardware, just to get your feet wet, get, get some feeling on how the operating work. Then we, once you start getting to like beta three or so on, uh, what I would do is actually take a new Mac, provision it like you do on Mac OS 12, remove any profile that may block the installation of beta versions of Mac OS, and then upgrade it to, you know, install the beta profile and upgrade it to Mac OS 13, and then see what works and what doesn't. And, you know, you may have to like, you may have some kernel panics. You may have to uninstall security tools. You may find things that are, you know, or, or, or VPN tools, things that are incompatible. Those are the things you will find as you were testing. As you get later into the beta cycle, and you may have to make some changes on as far as things like, hey, where do my profiles go? Oh, they're not scoped for Mac OS 13. I better fix that. After you get through some of the teething issues with figuring out your security tools and your security in other, you know, profiles and VPNs and things like that. Um, you want to actually upgrade a machine to Mac OS 13 and then enroll it. You know, maybe maybe upgrade the machine, then send a remote wipe to it so it still has Mac OS 13 on it, and then follow through your automated device enrollment workflow and determine what works, what doesn't, about what changes do you have to make. As we get closer to the OS release, as we get to the later beta cycles, into the beta seven, eight, nine days, that's about the point in time where as long as you have a good backup, you may want to consider updating your daily driver. So you live in the new OS, you know, before it's released. That will help you chase down other issues that you may uh, may have. Can advance the slide, please. So in my particular case, to set up a, a Mac OS uh, virtualization, you know, on, on Mac OS 12.5, I was able to set up a VM in, it's, the longest part of it was downloading the, IPSW, uh, this is an Apple Silicon Mac. So the first step, you want to virtualize Mac OS 13 machine, install the Xcode 14 beta. Why? Because it installs the updated mobile framework that tells Mac OS 12 how to provision a Mac OS uh, 13 device. Uh, I used uh, this app called UTM, uh, which is a polished version of the old QEMU uh, open source application. And uh, I leveraged the Mr. Macintosh website, and again, I'll call Ryan out for his stellar website. He has a listing of all of the IPSWs, including the beta ones. I was able to download the iOS 13 beta. And again, that was the longest, this entire process, the longest uh, 
elapsed time was waiting for the download to happen. Uh, once I had the download, I could use UTM and point it to the uh, IPSW and it set up a map, you know, I had some options, how much RAM, how much storage space did I want to pick and boom, suddenly I had a VM. I think the whole process was probably about 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, there's an Ars Technical article on other uh, virtualization apps that could be used to help test. Uh, UTM is mentioned, but I think they use a different one. So next slide, please. So as you go through these betas, uh, Apple's gotten much better about this in being able to update from beta two to beta three, for example, things like that. Sometimes there are things that go awry or things that may not work right, and you may need to do and pave or erase, you know, wipe and, and reprovision the device. If you're finding bugs, it'd be a really good idea to see if you could repeat that on another system, maybe one that didn't go through an upgrade from beta two to beta three. You know, don't assume it's a problem with beta three, for example. You can advance to the next slide. Uh, the betas come out every, about every two weeks or so. And again, Apple Dev RSS is your friend, usually on Tuesdays, except it was yesterday. And again, do not upgrade your daily driver unless you like to live dangerously. Not right away anyway. So next slide, please. So one of the challenges is a lot of the features new to the OS, new, a lot of new MDM profile keys and so on, must be supported by your MDM vendor. So you are kind of, even while you're doing the testing, you are at the, you're waiting for your MDM vendor to release support for that macOS version. Most of them have gotten pretty good about releasing support on the day of macOS release or a few days ahead of time, allowing you to get ahead of the curve with upgrading your server if you're on-premise or upgrading your instance, updating your profiles, what have you. Um, some MDM, cloud-based MDM vendors will spin up a trial version. You can get on their beta program. So if you really absolutely want to beta test uh, some of the new MDM features, like maybe the declarative MDM stuff, you can should talk to your MDM vendor and see what they're offering you. And I will point out again that if you it is it is impossible to manage properly manage macOS, iOS, or and or iPad OS today without an MDM. You need an MDM. If you don't have one, you have to get one. If you can't get one, you should probably find a new job. Just kidding, but no, you really need to convince your management. You need an MDM. Next slide, please. So when is Mac OS 13 gonna ship? So, you know, if we go by the track record of the last two, Big Sur was a November release. There were a lot of things that needed to be done for Apple Silicon support. It was pretty rough around the edges when it first shipped. So it kind of slipped in November. Uh, Monterey, by comparison, was a lot more stable and solid and ready, and that shipped in October. So I would venture to guess it's going to be sometime in the middle to end of October again. Maybe it'll be earlier, but you should plan that Apple will release this new OS sometime in the October timeframe. Next slide, please. So, Again, it's entirely possible that Apple, you know, we've, we've seen the new MT, M2 uh, MacBook Airs. Uh, we still have not seen an Apple Silicon Mac Pro. There's probably going to be M2 Pro versions of the new, of the 14 and 16 inch MacBook Pros and maybe some other Macs coming out, maybe some iMac updates or Mac mini updates and so on. A lot of these things could potentially be tied to Mac OS 13 support. So, um, you're going to want to make sure if those if you buying some of those devices in your plans, that's another reason for you to support Mac OS 13. If you're not going to be ready to support Mac OS 13, particularly in today's day and age where supply chain issues is a constant buzzword in the industry, you're going to want to make sure that you uh, have enough inventory of existing systems in stock to last you until you are ready to support Mac OS 13. And as long as that Mac hardware hasn't been revised, in theory, it's possible to downgrade it. Apple doesn't officially support it, but in theory, it does work. But you are far better off if you can support the latest version as soon as possible or stockpile older systems with older OSs and don't update them until you can support it. You should take stock of that situation. That was a bad pun. Uh, next slide, please. So major OS releases are always a good time to take a look at what you're doing in your environment. Are you still binding to active directory and using mobile accounts? You shouldn't be, it'll still work. But 
usually those first OSs have a lot of issues with mobile accounts. Apple had a lot of problems, you know, used, like every, the running joke was, uh, what was me if I deploy Mac OS before dot three, because invariably AD binding was broken or some mobile account creation wasn't working or, you know, or, or, or there was something that wasn't quite up to snuff. Um, also, you need to be taking real close eye at your security tools and what the track record has been um, as far as how quickly do they support new Apple technologies. You know, I think a lot of people were behind the eight ball on the whole uh, endpoint security framework because it was a big change and we had a pandemic and Apple couldn't have the developer kitchens they wanted. And, you know, that caused a, a lot of the ability, inability for, for teams to collaborate and having to learn to collaborate remotely. Uh, I think it reduced some of that and some of the changes to the OS too and the moving target status. So by now, you know, virtually all the security vendors should have released, you know, network security uh, and Apple Silicon based systems. In general, it's a really good idea to keep your um, security tool providers on a fairly short lease. The worst thing you want to do is find yourself in a situation where your organization is signed a three, four or five year contract with a vendor to provide support and a security tool and then they drop the ball on supporting a new Mac OS version and you're stuck. So you're either gonna like get rid of their product but still pay for it uh, and, and buy something else or like hire some really expensive lawyers to get out of their contract. So you are far better off to reduce the contracts for your security tools to one year that gives you an opt out. How is this relationship working? Evaluate it and so on. So next slide please. Uh, I will throw in the pitch for the Mac OS Security Compliance Project. Uh, this is something that uh, that has been developed by Mac admins for Mac admins to help. It's an open source tool that will evaluate your current security configuration against various NIST standards, DISA-STIG, and CIS. It can generate uh, guidance, scripts, configuration profiles that remediate security settings. You can pick your security baseline. You don't have to use one of the ones there. You can customize it. Um, I believe there's going to be a Philly Mac admins meeting um, on August 9th with uh, discussing the Mac OS security plans project. I know they've Alan Goldbig and Bob Gendler and so on have uh, done some presentations and write ups and so on. There's actually an Apple KB on this too, as well as the GitHub page. So, next slide, please. OK, when you talk about testing your enrollment workflows, um, if you don't have it documented what your provisioning workflow is, like, you know, this is what happens when a Mac is enrolled. I create this account. This setting is changed. This, these configuration profiles are deployed. Office is installed. Chrome is installed. Microsoft Remote Desktop is installed, yada, yada. If you don't have that documented, when you go provision a machine on Mac OS 13, how do you know that something worked as expected? You need to be able to refer back to that run book. So make sure you do that. Make sure you have that. Put it in your Confluence page or what have it. Create a Word document. Whatever your documentation mechanism is, make sure it's something that you know people know where it is, so that you have. You know, this is what our, our this is the flow. Now I can compare that flow against this new device and did things work the way I wanted to. So, uh, next slide, please. And again, test your process. You want to do this first, you know, nowadays, and then it should start and, you know, should start with an Apple Silicon Mac. And it should also start with a T, and then also continue with a T2 Mac. Um, whether you test a T1, non T2 Mac, depends if you have any, I guess. Uh, you know, again, I feel in my organization, those are not going to be long for this world. And if you have any devices that are not in automated device enrollment, you could test the provisional enrollment in the iOS computer app. Just be aware that, again, that, th that, Enrollment is provisional for 30 days. That MDM profile can be removed also if the device is wiped at any point in time of the day, you'll have to, you'll have to re provisionally enroll it. So keep that in mind. Uh, if you've got a bunch of devices that aren't, that were not in Apple Business Manager and you want to get them in, it may not be a half bad idea to provisionally enroll them and then stick them in a closet for a month. Because once those 30 days pass, that MDM profile is not removable and that device, if it, no matter if it's erased or not, becomes permanently associated with your uh, Apple Business Manager or Apple School Manager account. Next slide, please. OK, uh, what are the applications and services and tools that your organization use? Do they work with the new OS? And you can just start with, does the app launch? Is there basic functionality? But you really need to expand this beyond to other people that like live and breathe in this app. 
you know, if you work with a, in a design agency, you want people working in the creative suite to work, to be testing the creative suite on maybe a test machine or second machine or whatever, to make sure that things are working as expected. And you'll want to come up with test plans. You want to find out who in your organization, you know, who in the organization is responsible for this app and that it working. Um, you know, if it's a larger organization. So next slide, please. Okay, you definitely want to find some early adopters. And in the late beta cycle, you want these early adopters to be upgrading uh, to the beta version of the OS. You identifying who these early adopters is, is more of an art, not a science. But in general, you want to find people of a wide variety of experience levels. You know, you don't want to find just power users. You want novice users as well. You want intermediate users. You want people who have the ability to be to communicate well and people who are patient and understand that this is going to be a beta and things may not work correctly. If you have somebody who is very particular and not very flexible or not very patient, probably not a good beta tester. So again, you want to identify who these people are and you want to come up with a plan of when, you know, who these people are going to be and when you're going to offer the new OS to them. But you probably need to have expand that beta pool. So next slide, please. Um, Kanji has a really good article about uh, testing pre-release operating systems, covers a lot of the same things we talked about here, but uh, in case you want to look at that blog, and again, all these links are posted in the PSU Mac channel and Mac admin Slack. So next slide. Uh, reporting bugs to Apple. So uh, how many people are familiar with Feedback Assistant? Yeah, let's go ahead. We used to be ca called filing a radar. They've said they have a deprecated radar. You can advance to the next slide. So Feedback Assistant, is both an application installed in your system as well as a website. And if you're using your managed Apple ID, which you should, uh, you know, this goes to the right people, number one. It, it also allows you to uh, see feedback from others in your organization if you're part of a large team. Uh, there is also some feedback posted in Mac Admin Slack. So there is a channel on Mac Admins Slack uh, where people talk about the betas of the OS. It's not a public channel because of Apple's non-disclosure agreement. So you must join the Apple Apple Seed channel where there are instructions to tell you how to provide the proof uh, that you have Apple Business Manager, Apple School, so you can access the app, the, the the secure Apple channel, the private one, the hidden one that's not publicly available. But that is definitely useful to have because people will report their things, and there will be things that I, you know, that literally, you know. I may have worked with the beta for hours and hours, but other people have picked up on things that I didn't, and so on. So it can be beneficial. And it's been nice to be able to find, see people's feedback and say, oh, I'm gonna dupe that. Now, duping feedback, not something you should do is just like copy paste and say, yep, I have the same problem. You should definitely tailor it more uh, towards your organization. Say, hey, I have the same problem as this. We're trying to do X and the new version of doesn't support Y and this is gonna cause a problem for us and so on. So um, if you advance to the next slide, Here's Feedback Assistant, what it looks like, the actual application. We can go to the next slide also. Um, there was actually a presentation here in the campfire session by uh, Brad Chapman and Millie Marsh on the seven habits of highly effective feedback. Highly recommend it. I'm not going to duplicate what some of the, any more of the things that they said there. So watch that session if you want to learn more. Um, next slide, please. Again, Reiterating the point, always use that Apple ID associated with Apple Business Manager or Apple School Manager to file feedback. Don't use the developer one. Um, really important to file feedback in each release because sometimes Apple will say, we fixed this in beta three. And you're like, oh, really? Still, we're broken for me. So if when, when the new beta drops, if you have feedbacks on things, uh, update that feedback or file new feedback if things are not working as expected. Um, if you have access to Apple Care Enterprise, strongly recommend opening ACE cases for feature requests or defects or major potential design issues in the OS. Uh, if you have a good relationship with your Apple system engineer, I would, rec I would email the feedback ID in the ACE case uh, to your SE. Uh, if it's something that's really important, that the SEs do have an escalation path uh, for serious issues. Like this is like, you know, this is broken and, we can't buy any more Macs and we buy 30,000 Macs a year. That's going to get some attention by Apple. So again, be aware that there's an escalation path for those issues. So next slide, please. So there's a profile and logging page. There's a lot of things here for like debugging Wi-Fi profiles and so on located here. 
Um, again, this is posted in the PSU Mac channel on Slack, so no need to copy it down. Next slide. Uh, Apple's updated the documentation uh, in that you can more readily determine the changes between Mac OS versions. Um, I've also put some of the new device management and, uh, documentation up on GitHub, which I welcome uh, for Apple. So that's, that's a pretty great uh, advancement. Next slide. So if you've gone through the whole session and you feel overwhelmed or you feel like you don't have enough time to really dig into some of the changes, at least do two things that should take you maybe a couple of hours. Number one, get that what's new for enterprise education PDF from Apple Seed from IT and read it. Number two, watch the what's new in managing Apple devices. That's where a lot of the things we've talked about here, particularly relating around to declarative MDM and S SSO. Um, and, uh, you know, watch that video. Next slide. And again, there are other relevant WWDC sessions around declarative man device management, managed device attestation, pass keys. Next slide. Uh, Rich Troughton collected an excellent series of notes from the labs and the Slack channels. Um, as a thread of Apple developer forums, I believe you do need a developer ID to be able to read them. Also, there was a really interesting technical blog from somebody who does works to figure out ways to get Mac old, new version of Mac OS run on older Macs, talking about some of the under the hood changes. If you're somebody who's like a real geek, uh, you'll find some interesting stuff in that article. Next slide. Uh, so thank yous to the folks at Penn State uh, once again for having the conference. Uh, you know, it sucks that it's the third consecutive year that we've had to do this remote. Hopefully we're able to in a position where we can do this in person again next year. Uh, special thanks again to Gretchen, Rusty, Christopher, you know, all the people who worked at Help in the past, Dave Test, Josh Miller, Justin. Uh, we owe a big debt of thanks to the sysadmins uh, from the community who have been absorbed by the mothership. And there's a couple of new ones that we brought in this year. Um, one of the challenges I think with Ventura is that the enterprise team really hasn't had a seat at the table. So as a result, a lot of these features, when they come out of the WWDC oven, are sort of, from an enterprise perspective, half-baked. So Apple has a pro has an enterprise workflow team now uh, that literally just started a month before Ventura, so they've had no impact on it. But they will have a seat at the table and will have influence on design and product decisions moving forward. So hopefully this means that we will have less of these, oh, snap, this new feature in, in this new OS is really bad and we need a way to stop this or control this or hide this or suppress this. And we don't have to keep filing all these feedbacks and, you know, and panicking. So, but again, a big thank you to all of these people from the community who have migrated to the, to the mothership and we really appreciate your efforts. These people are really working hard to try to make our lives better. Uh, next slide, please. Also want to thank you to all the people who contribute on Slack, Jamf Nation, GitHub, and your personal blogs. So many people. I mean, I don't know how many, I don't know how much time Rich Trout has personally saved me, but it's probably in the thousands of hours. Um, and I, you know, want to thank these people, uh, you know, for, for the impact they've had in the community. The Macavian community is really great because people are generally very friendly and very willing to share information. And again, I want to thank you for attending this session. Uh, one request I have for you, if you turn to the next slide, if you have a way to give back to the community, please do so. Whether it's just a post on Slack, hey, I found this bug, or I think this is a feature, or this is really cool, I didn't know this. Uh, you know, please contribute. Find some way to contribute. Twitter, blogging, Jamf Nation, whatever. Share something you've learned. We are a very welcoming community, the Mac and Min community, and the only way we succeed is by everybody contributing. Uh, I think that's probably about it for the slides. So do we have any questions? Do we have time for any questions? All right, Robert, yeah. thank you very much for that presentation um, and the kind words. We uh, we do have some questions, and I think we have a few minutes for questions still here. Um, we have the first one, how does that platform SSO work with zero touch deployment? So yeah, that's, that's sort of the challenge with the fact that it cannot create a local account. So you have to have another way to create a local account. Now, again, your MDM can create a local account for you or it can prompt you during the enrollment process to create that local account. So I guess a lot of it depends on your MDM, uh, any other tools you might use like Jam Connect, your other workflows. Um, you know, it certainly seems like it's an area that could 
be extended further and further release OS releases by Apple to allow for that dynamic account creation. I mean, it'd be great if we could get a Mac to a login window and just log into Azure AD and have it create the account automatically. I don't think we're we're clearly not there today, but that would be ideal. How should local accounts be created if platform SSO doesn't facilitate this task? What's the proposed best practice? Why would Apple not want to also create new accounts, which this kind of ties into what we were just talking about? Yeah, so in our organization, we create the account during enrollment. You know, the user's prompted to create an account. Uh, and that had, it's probably pretty widespread. We, you know, you also have the, you know, that doesn't mean that that's the only account created. You can also create a hidden in, hidden admin account if you want, or not hidden admin account secondarily. Um, you know, we used to have the Python create user package, but of course that was dependent on Python 2 and kind of deprecated. There is another, I think it's MK user. I can't remember the name of the tool, but there is another tool out there. I don't personally use it, but there are uh, free and open source tools that can help you create users on the system. And they have, they're a lot more flexible too than the old Python create user were you know so i guess a lot of it depends too in your workflow what your you know whether your workflow is we have technicians to provision machines or whether we have users provision machines so you're more likely going to need that those third-party tools if you're having technicians provision machines but the general trend has been having users self-provision you know, okay. step one unbox the mac step two turn it on so there's step three there's no step three Always a nice process. Um, not, Anonymous asks, how are critical security updates pushed out without a reboot if the OS is immutable? So there are the uh, the cryptexes in Venture, uh, and, and I haven't dug deeply into how that actually, actually works, but there is a mechanism to do that. I mean, clearly they have it working and they've made whatever architectural changes. Uh, to do so. Whether those updates are somehow staged on a writable volume and then not actually moved into place on a total restart, but they're still loaded, I'm not entirely sure. That's a really good question. That's a Frogger question, in the private channel. In theory, could declarative MDM fix the common issues in GF Connect when the auth database gets flushed after a major OS update and thus the macOS login window defaults from the GF Connect IDP UI back to the standard Apple UI? and is broken blank or missing? So that's a qu difficult question for me to answer because I'm not a Jam Connect user, um, but that that strikes me as another one of those, it sounds like it potentially could, but you'd have to actually ask Jam if, it, if the current implementation of, of this would support it. Like I said, there's been, I've, I've had three or four things that, hey, it'd be really nice if declarative, I'd like to do X, can declarative X? No. But that's a good idea. I've had that, like I said, this just keeps coming up. We're still in version 1.0. So if it can't do it today, that might be a solution down the road. Okay, comment here from DDS Cups is not depreciated. PPDs will be eventually in Cups 3. Ooh. Ventura is on Cups 2.3. Wonder if this includes Apple's own print PPD in their airport framework. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure uh, if something has changed about that, but it certainly was not, you know, Apple's in, Apple owns cups first and foremost, but it, but Apple was intended to move strictly to IPP. I don't know if they've changed their, their posture on that. And if they're looking to adopt cups three, but. Just a quick comment. Uh, when you were mentioning, mentioning the VM applications, uh, Anonymous said that the other VM apps are Anka and Tart. So that's A-N-K-A -A and TART, T-A-R-T, -T, for those who were curious. They yeah, I think they're I think they're both mentioned in that in that article in the link that's in the in the page. Like I said, I, I had gotten myself from there with UTM and went down that path. I didn't I didn't do a bake off. <laughs> I just wanted to I just wanted to actually get Ventura installed in a system so that I could start looking at it, playing with it, and scratching my head a little bit at it. As far as I know, okay. I think you can also use you can also use parallels to revert, to use the virtualization framework as well. Awesome. All right. Well, the the slides will be published somewhere, Michael. That's one of the questions um, that we can get the slides, Robert. Yeah. Well, you got them. You already got them. It'll be That's in true. YouTube. <laughs> um, 
And then Anonymous says, if we should abandon binding to AD, what are some of the options to use our org network identities? So I guess a lot, a lot of it depends on what your, you know, where your organization is. If you're st still dealing with on-premise AD or are you using, you know, are you still, are you potentially moving to Azure AD? Are you, you know, using Jump Cloud? Are you using Okta, Ping, you know, what have you? Google, you know, there's, there's a, you know, you have, you have to sort of look at where the strategy of your entire organization is going before you make that that choice. All right, fantastic. And, and you and, and usually most organizations are you know are more than just Max, so you know you have to kind of have those conversations with the other teams. Fantastic. All right. Well, that uh, that is the last of our questions. So I thank you again, Robert, for taking the time today to present. Yeah. Sorry for the technical snafus, but. Oh, no problem. That's uh, that's why we're here, right? We're all IT Blame. and Blame interruption Microsoft. management. <laughs> so thank you again. Um,